Uh, first, I want to piggyback on his uh, comments about Portland. Um, I love the little neighborhoods. I grew up in I grew up in the California neighborhood. And back in those days, all neighborhoods belong to everybody, pretty much. My sister-in-law, who's African-American, and grew up in Portland. So I'm so glad he alluded to that, how a lot of the uh, rumors you hear about Portland people, I have a colleague that works with me on some other things. She jokes that when she's coming down to my house, I live on the border of Portland and Shawnee. Folks will joke with her and say, oh, don't go to Portland. And that's, that's unfortunate. There's a lot of misinformation about our neighborhoods and about history, and we're going to touch on that a bit today. Uh, first of all, this was a presentation that we were originally going to do during Black History Month. Then we were going to do it during uh, Women's History Month. And somehow or another, here we are in October, so apologies for taking uh, so long. But in a way, I'm happy about that. Because in my view, we should not have a Black History Month. We should not have a Women's History Month. This is history that pertains to all of us. And all of us need to be more aware of our common history, our common heritage, and some of the realities that are associated with it, including that Portland was a neat little neighborhood then, and it is now. Today, we're going to talk about, I'll probably be jumping all over the place, but how modern medicine began in this country in general, but specifically to point out some things that people have forgotten about Louisville, Kentucky, and in other areas of the country. So that's a fancy schmancy title, The Dawn of Modern Medicine in Kentucky Remembrances from the African American Journey. And the picture here is of a school that was established near the turn of the last century called Louisville National Medical College. Now don't get that confused with a marker downtown in front of, in front of a very, very grand building, which was the precursor to the medical school. This was a medical school that was opened at the turn of the last century by African Americans for African Americans. Medical school. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Today, I'm Martina Nichols Cunningham. And today I'm here in the capacity of the Samuel Plato Academy, whose tagline is rebuilding community one structure at a time. So we mean structurally, we mean culturally, we mean historically. And today, my partner in crime, and I'm thanking her so much for rescuing me today, Amira Granger who happens to be the president of the Chickasaw Neighborhood Federation, and she is also president of the Friends of Greenwood Cemetery. And there's a special reason I've asked her to be here today, and we'll see that later. Next slide. Okay. We have to start off with reality. So prior to the 20th century, medical training in this country was very basic, very rudimentary. There was not a lot of formal training in this country. You kind of hung out with a person that called himself doctor or someone who considered themselves to be a healer in the community and you picked up tips and uh, secrets of the trade that way. Uh, there were later some medical schools after the Civil War, uh, medical schools did begin to pop up in this country, but they are usually like one or two year programs, 18 month programs, not very lengthy at all. Um, there were, of course, in Europe, a long tradition of medical schools, and folks that could afford it would trek up to Europe, including some African Americans that we'll talk about. But I'll get next slide. Here's a quote from someone that made a lot of difference in the treatment of medical care in this country, uh, Abraham Flexner. And at one point, he was engaged by the Carnegie Foundation, or Mr. Carnegie, 
to, because once the school started forming, they were still like, there was no standards that had been set. So the Carnegie Foundation hired Mr. Flexner to travel around the country and evaluate these uh, places of education for medical uh, education. And he came to the conclusion, I love this quote, a patient has a 50-50 chance of benefiting from visiting a physician. So in those days, he likened standard practices akin to voodoo. You were taking a risk. And uh, he was set forth to help form those standards. Now, a lot of people are critical of Mr. Flexner because he was not a physician himself. He was a reformer in terms of education. So there's some folks that have issue with someone who did not have that expertise as a background. How could he be setting the standards? But I think, I think that's a legitimate statement for the status of medical care uh, at the turn of the last century. Next slide. Be that as it may, after the Civil War, as the Gilded Age moved in, after Reconstruction, after all the exciting things that were associated with that, you began to see attempts in the uh, country to standardize, to upgrade, uh, to provide better health care, better facilities. And there were a lot of things that drove that. First of all, we have a lot of advances scientifically in terms of medications, uh, treatments, therapy. We <coughs> also see during this period, so this will be like right after the turn of the last century, and in the early years of the 20th century, you also began to see uh, programs where nurses were actually being trained. And many times, hospitals that were uh, coming into existence began to open up their own nursing schools. You began to see specialties rise up. So as radiological science came into play, you began to see people that were trying to do that. So it's a very dynamic time at the turn of the century in terms of medicine. Uh, so much happening in a, in a very, very rapid pace. So here I have included a list, and it's not a complete list, because I don't think the Catholic hospitals are on this list. But it gives you a rough idea about how within a span of maybe 30 years or 20 years, Louisville went from having few hospitals to a lot of hospitals. Um, and some of you may be able to help me remember which ones are on this, <laughs> on this slide. I know the one in the, uh, this one is particularly significant because it was the Jewish hospital. Uh, does anybody recognize any of the yeah, others? The one in the upper left-hand corner, I think that's the old St. Mary's and Elizabeth. St. Mary's and Elizabeth. And then the lower right-hand corner is uh, St. Anthony's, okay. I believe. Is this? And then Norton Hospital yeah. is in the center. Okay. It looks like the old Norton. Norton in the center. And then down below, that's that so looks like is. Our Lady of Peace, it looks like. Uh -huh. St. No. Oh, St. it looks Saint like St. Joseph. Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph. So on this list from the directory of 1930, they did not include the Catholic hospitals, so I tried to include some of them. This is not a complete uh, listing of the hospitals that existed by 1930, but I wanted to give you an idea about the types of facilities that sprung up in just a very short amount of time, if you think about it. And then uh, the yellow marks are marks that indicate where black people could go at that time. So this was the height of Jim Crow, of course. And uh, coming out of slavery, and the period that followed, African Americans had many challenges in terms of uh, including finding a place where they could acquire medical care. And so Jewish Hospital and their original charter, if I remember correctly, I think it was their original charter, specified people of all races will be welcome here. Um, but not so much in the other hospitals. Sometimes in the other hospitals they would have awards specifically for colored people. Uh, but 
it was kind of a, a risky business. Now, here we have the Red Cross, what later became the Red Cross uh, Sanatorium, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, um, so there were attempts by the African American to provide their own care, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about. Let me see before you go. Citizens National Hospital, I have no idea what that was. And um, so there was a couple on this list that I'm not sure where they were that did provide care to the colored folks at that time. Next slide. Does anybody recognize this place? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the front of Baptist, but I'm not sure. It it's is. Like yeah, they, they completely destroyed it. I mean, that, yeah. they destroyed it 40 years ago. That is a beautiful porch. Well, I've heard quite a bit about the Baptist Hospital, uh, mainly because under another hat that I'm wearing, maybe the planning and preservation, we've been trying to save that building. We're still fighting over that building. But I wanted everybody to see how it looked originally because it was a gorgeous, gorgeous building. And the Baptist. So the other thing that changed over the years in terms of hospitals being built, you know, now when anything's going to be built, we're talking tips, we're talking public funding, we're talking a lot of money that is coming uh, usually from governmental sources and private funds. The hospitals at the turn of the last century, they were primarily built by churches. And so there was a different spirit that went along with that, that we no longer have in for-profit medicine. There was a Christian commitment, there was a Jewish commitment, there was a commitment to service to the patients that you don't see today. And so this hospital was built by funds at the Baptist. It took them like 25, 30 years to raise the money. But this was their goal. They talked about it, they talked about it, they talked about it, and they didn't. Now the reason the building became so ugly was in their wisdom they built a, you know, this big structure with the idea of we can always add on to it. So their aesthetics were not exactly in keeping with ours today. It was more in terms of practicality. Where can we put an additional wing? Where can we do this? Where can we do that? And so uh, I just had to include it. It was at its time, a state-of-the-art facility that people all over the country talked about. That at last, we were, they were going to be able to open up medical care. Because before then, medical care was either delivered at home, more or less. You would bring in somebody you knew that knew a little bit about what to do about the or whatever. If it was really bad and you knew a physician, the physician would come to the house. Only go to a hospital, they were considered poor houses at that time. So this is also a significant period in that it marks a time when medical care was improving te you know, te technically and in terms of equipment and education, but also medical care was going to be available to the masses in a way that it wasn't before. You also see a lot of these ho uh, hospitals in communities as a way to cement the ties within the community. So these were community hospitals accessible uh, to folks in the country. I didn't mean to go on that long about that, but that's one of my favorite subjects. Okay. But with innovation, with uh, cultural change, there has always been the Negro problem. <laughs> and coming out of slavery, it was defined in a certain way. And through the first uh, years of the uh, 20th century, it was a gnawing issue. And I just include three examples here of the folks that wrote about it. Booker T. Washington and W.D. E. Du Bois wrote about it. And of course, they wrote about it, in my opinion, in a more informed way. But it is so great to think. We're so far from this now in terms of time. It's just sort of surreal to think 
that this would have been a scholarly topic <laughs> that people would write about over and over again. They would have conferences about it. And they would, in the absence of real African Americans being in the room and part of the discussion, come up with grand ideas about how to solve social problems. And it didn't always work out very well. Uh, this document in particular is, um, it's very troubling to read, but it's very informative in that it describes the Negro problem in terms of physical issues, structurally, that black people had. There's really a very disturbing tone that reminds us now in the 21st century that this was just years out of the time when most folks who were not African American considered the descendants of slaves to be a little more than farm animals. And so in documents such as this, you, you see that language. It, it's pretty chilling, actually. But it also demonstrates how far we've come. Next slide. OK, now. So in many rooms across the nation, a gathering of people, usually white, usually males, made decisions about what was going to happen with the Negro problems. And in terms of health care, we tend to think of that. We tend to think of uh, the black community as a community waiting for someone to come and rescue it. And that really was not the case. Once emancipation occurred, uh, folks were so excited and so full of optimism about what was possible that they networked with each other, they had friends in the white community that helped them. And so you see in the black community uh, efforts to build community in so many ways. So you do see an explosion of churches, you do see an explosion of educational opportunities. Sometimes it just meant, and the genesis, sort of, in this period of, yeah, you have to stay a little, a little farther away, uh, <laughs> of an NCNW, uh, Council of Negro Women. Yeah, organizations such as that. Yeah, are they are still, still viable in Louisville? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. So you see a lot of that. You see a sense of community that is not necessarily as intense or present today. But along those lines, in terms of health care, folks got together at one point, and this is some years down the road, uh, well, 1899, not that far down the road, that plans for the Red Cross Hospital began. And so I have a picture for you here of the original site. It's still there. Parts of it have been demolished. Does anybody know where it is? Shelby Street. Salvation Street. Salvation Street. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, it's where Volunteers of America. Oh, Volunteers of America. Volunteers of America. But this is the site where the nurses live. They did a little training there. There was a hospital there. It was full service. Here is the lady that when you, the only problem I have with these markers and I don't get a lot of the markers, but it tends to distill a very interesting, robust history into two or three people did this, one or two institutions did this, and we are not able to recall how dynamic the community, white, black, or whatever, was at a given time, and how much talent was there, how many efforts were made. Mary Merritt is the one that folks generally associate with Red Cross Hospital because of that marker. And she was a remarkable woman. This is her in her older years. She was at a meeting such as what you described probably being uh, congratulated for her life of service. Several years ago, uh, Sherry Hamilton Bryant, whose mother was a nurse at Red Cross Hospital, she and others, um, work to get the historic marker there. It was, a, it was a cool thing, so that just shows politicians doing what they do and they want the marker. That was good for to share with you. Next slide. Okay, so even though Red Cross Hospital began in 1899, there were really efforts before that in terms 
terms of black hospitals, and most people don't know that today. Most people don't uh, know how far along the community, black community was all over the country in terms of developing their own systems of medical care. Next, uh, next slide, Steve. But I've got to say this up front. I think there were somewhere I read it, uh, there was over a hundred, there were so many black medical schools in this country that were established after the, the uh, Civil War. And the question has recently been asked more and more, in fact there's conferences on this, I may have a slide about this later on, where folks are looking at what happened to those black medical schools. And the reason they ask that is that even though we are at a point now where African Americans can technically go anywhere, the impact of the Flexner Report on African American schools on women couldn't just go to any medical school either. And so once he issued this report, his, his thesis was, there are too many hospitals. We'd be better off with fewer hospital, fewer hospital schools, I'm sorry. Fewer medical schools, better medical schools, and that'll be, that'll be it. So in his mind, in his um, mind, fewer is going to be better. And on the surface of things, that makes sense because you would have fewer, you could put more resources. Uh, resources into the future. But what about folks who... Yeah. Thank you. Of course, 
she would ask him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't tell you right now. There's a sign, there's a marker down on Chestnut Street where the YMCA is at 7th and right there <laughs> by the church that's falling. Yeah. Now that's really the medical school art that was associated with the University of they had, and, and the marker does say um, Louisville Medical College, so it's easy to get confused. I believe this was on Shelby on the Paris, I don't know, offhand. But it was founded by two by one physician who moved here from Canada after the Civil War. You know, many expatriates from Kentucky escaped into Canada to escape slavery and all the things that were going on here, there. And uh, afterwards, so many of them came back to Kentucky to set up schools, to set up uh, churches, to set up uh, this medical college. Uh, Mr. Mazik, if you're familiar with Alfred Mazik, he was one of those folks who moved back to Kentucky to start an educational movement. But this was established by a fellow named Henry Fitzbutler, and he and his wife uh, moved here for the specific purpose of rallying the troops and starting a medical school, which they did. Next slide. Hmm. So this is a very impressive photo, which shows Mr. Fitzbutler. I don't think I have a Mr. Fitzbutler and the lady up in the up, uh, up in the corner, near the corner, was his wife. Mm -hmm. Now, when she came here, she was not um, a medical professional. But once they got the school up and going, she attended classes and became certified, and she also became Dr. Fitzbutler. And then, in her capacity at that school, she did double duty in teaching courses in the uh, medical arts, uh, not only to potential doctors, but also to nurses. So they had their own in-house nursing uh, program. This lady here, and I'm not going to have a good picture of her, is a lady, Artisha Gilbert. And uh, Ms. Granger's going to talk about her more later. But look at this. So many times after the uh, Flexner Report, these black medical schools were depicted as wild and crazy places and just off the chart. Um, it was really horrible the way they demeaned these schools. But don't these people look trustworthy, studious, someone you'd like to visit? <laughs> I mean, they don't look like they're going to move you out in the backyard <laughs> at all. They were impressive individuals. Next slide. Now this was their operating room. One of their operating rooms. Here. You know, those early medical schools, including the one here that's on First Street, whatever, uh, they didn't have electricity. That's why they always had to have the operating room and the cadaver and all that on the top floor with, with glass windows in the top. And also, look at the opening of a, you know, a skylight to bring the light out. They were operating under very trying circumstances. Next slide. Okay, so when you look at the newspapers of the time, there is some reference to the Louisville National Medical School uh, in the courier here and there. But it's usually, oh, they're running out of money. It's usually not in a positive light, and they don't talk about what was being offered there or how much they accomplished. This comes from the American Baptist uh, newspaper, which later evolved into, I think that paper still exists today, but it's under another title, uh, under the Baptist uh, organization. But this is an ad from, uh, and so every issue they would have an ad telling how much, $45, isn't that wonderful, to go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> and the various things, I can see these slides aren't very clear, but they were offering um, training in uh, pharmacology, so they trained pharmacists, they trained nurses. Um, they had it going on back in those days. Next slide. I included this 
United States. And so an overview of the United States all together. But I was impressed that they included Louisville, Kentucky's National Medical College. So that demonstrates how prominent it was, how significant it was. In his report, Flexner gave it high marks, actually. Very high marks. But he was going to stick to that idea of we only need two in the country. And that is, you know, once he said that, the funders that they had, the support that they had, it created um, concern and worry. People started backing out that it's going to be what it's going to be. And ultimately, they did uh, close down. Next slide. Hey, uh, before we move on, Gary, that was at your library. If you know I started that one, and then I came here to get involved with the LHL. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go back to the slide that has all the faculty members. Oh, oh, yeah, so that was a very rough overview of, of the topic. As you can tell, I could talk all day, and we could go down all kinds of avenues. But I want to talk about this lady. And this is why I invited Ms. Stranger here to talk today. So, um, do you want to know what I'm You're welcome. <laughs> Ms. Stranger is the president of uh, Friends of Greenwood Cemetery. You may have heard a lot about Friends of Greenwood Cemetery, or Greenwood Cemetery this week, but it's nothing to do with us. Um, however, in that cemetery, we have three people on Night Barry, and I've asked Ms. Franklin to be here today. Okay. Um, good afternoon. And, um, I don't have any thoughts on everything that's been shared, so I guess I'll talk about, I'll teleport from this lady to my thoughts. <laughs> um, it's been really interesting my, my thoughts will be kind of how all these things kind of uh, pop for me in my mind and my heart with the work that I'm doing and the work that I look to do um, and, and encourage other people to do. Um, in learning about this doctor, and I don't want to say her name wrong, so I'm going to make sure I'm going to put her Because I thought it was interesting, no name is worth seeing. And I'm curious if that was a family carryover.
that we research with relation to Greenwood Cemetery. Um, I knew, I don't want to say regular people, but I always thought of cemeteries as just, it's a, it's a place of burial, but it's more than that. And there's the unique stories of those individuals, obviously we, we share that, but to think of maybe people who get a lot of attention or who maybe were phenomenal and their stories are there waiting to be discovered like anyone that they're next to, you know? And so to learn more about this lady and to hopefully share that in the future, I've always admired um, Friends of Eastern Cemetery. They report stories about people throughout the year. And I would love to share this because I think it, one, is um, a story that needs to be shared. Um, just one thing I want to pause on in there. This makes me think about the issues we have contemporarily with black maternal health and how in this country I think white women have the greatest chance of dying in childbirth, of dying after childbirth, than any other industrialized nation. And so my thing is, if we are lagging in that, and then black women have a greater chance of dying in that, and you have all of these prospective medical folks that could have linked to that, there's lots of conversations around how that could have been changed, but also the things we need to reflect on now that we have the opportunity to make healthcare be safer for everybody. Um, practices that are safe for women and not just studying based on men or based on a certain population, but that we make sure that all people can be safe with the procedures that you need and maybe going back to some more um, natural practices. And so that gets me to my notes, I think, because that way I'm going to get way off of it. Um, Travels around Kentucky that I've had this, this year um, makes me appreciate more of where this, this doctor was born. And just thinking about the simple life that people were living in, but it was also complicated because that was the time that everyone knew. So the progression that we make throughout the state with our families moving, and then what happens, what opportunities await, what challenges maybe are thrown in our way. Working with neighbors, uh, meeting new neighbors. I think for me, working with neighbors across the city. It's not just for me that the people in my immediate neighborhood, but meeting people in other neighborhoods and how we are stronger together. Finding appreciation and shedding fear of cemeteries. As a kid, I don't know, I was scared of the thriller video and things like that. Just made me think that cemeteries were scary places. And and that's a viewpoint, maybe uniquely uh, US viewpoint, I don't know, but somehow or another, there's a lot of people who don't view death and, and those spaces as being scary. And so I'm, I'm glad to be shedding that. Um, fear and, and perception, um, and also unearthing the stories of different people there so more people can celebrate and kind of bring new energy. Is she there? Is she a green She is a green Why didn't you leave with that? Well, that's the only thing Oh my God. She's going to this one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I, when I find that information, I will share that. And the fact 
fact, that's what I'm scanning my phone for, because there were reasons, not only that disadvantaged black medical schools, I'm finding out right. so much today, but the medical schools and practices, period. So, and I will forward that information to both of you. I think that deliberate part is really, um, really something heavy, and that is another note I had. Um, I have had the pleasure of seeing the film Origin. Has anyone else seen it? Okay, well, I encourage you to. I say that because um, the, the articles and the studies and the conferences about the Negro problem um, made me think about that film. And so the film is based on the nonfiction book Cast. Um, I think Isabel Wilkerson is the author of that book. Um, I'm working on chomping through that book, but the film is a piece of fiction that the, um, the uh, filmmaker felt was the best way to reveal the story. So I urge you to see it. I think um, it is a very powerful story about cast and how <coughs> racism is not necessarily the only beast here in this country and how we have a, a shared story of oppression around the world that, that people share. This is how we oppress people here. Maybe you can use it over there for what you're doing. And so that's part of the, the story. It's not a giveaway because the movie is very, um, takes you on a journey. And I, I mean, I heard you it's called Earth Origin. But that, to, to say the Negro problem, that was the United States' contribution to Germany at a certain point in their um, plans for what they wanted to execute. And so again, Origin, Amy Duvernay is the director. Um, and so lastly, yeah, the nations have recently been left. I want to talk about that. Okay, one more thing. Okay, so she brought that back up. So the last thing, and then I'll pass it back to Martina. We, um, as friends of Greenwood Cemetery, plan to have a vigil on November 2nd um, for the community, but also for the individuals that rest there to um, just have a moment. There will be some opportunities to sign up, but it will also allow families, friends, or individuals just to honor or recognize someone who's buried there to um, pay respectful homage to those that um, were interned there but maybe who didn't have their um, their buries, burials honored in the way that they should. And also to bring peace to the families that deserve to be able to visit um, their relatives at any point and not have felt the pain that they felt over these last few decades. Um, and so that's November 2nd. It will be at sunset. And um, you can see us afterwards if you have more questions or follow us on Facebook. But um, yeah, I think that would be all that I want to say. of my grandmother who was trained as a nurse at the uh, 
Louisville uh, National Medical School, and there is a gorgeous photo of her sitting very, you know, primly in a chair, you know, a nurse. Unfortunately, during these times, there were all only so many places she could go to work. So she was never able to practice her training. She had to work as a domestic all of her life. It's interesting to go to the census records, and she will have insisted that they write down nurse, squeeze it in there, <laughs> to remind people that she had more to offer than what it appeared from the uh, census form. I have a wonderful photo of her. My cousin Fuzzy tore it from a photo album because he thought it was a neat picture and took it to his home in Cincinnati. So I'm still working on getting it back. But that's the kind of spirit that this school conveyed to its student, students and the larger community. Um, we need to work on getting that kind of cohesion and pride back. And then the very last statement that I So, I guess I've been a little hard on Mr. Flexner too. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, maybe. But this quote, now and always, is pertinent. Nations have recently been led to borrow billions for war. No nation has ever borrowed largely for education. Probably no nation is rich enough to pay for both war and civilization. We must make our choice. We cannot have both. And for that quote alone, I'm going to give Mr. Price. I'm going to give him some slack. Yeah, a B plus. <laughs> and that's all for me. Thank you very much. Questions? If anyone has a question or two? Yes. Martina, uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps Flexner was chosen because he wasn't in the medical field and might have been, quote, more objective. And you're right, this is a redeeming quote. Um, because had he been more attached to the field, he might have been more subjective in his assessment. So thank you for sharing that, because it does sort of moderate my impression of him. Other questions? Do we have any others? Well, anyway, so Martin, very enlightening here with this uh, presentation, and uh, we will be